servants of the master of the entire universe. And in his name, there is victory. We are foregoing today um, our typical sermon series to address an issue this morning uh, that I believe is, is very pertinent. And um, to be honest with you, what has been taking place, this is actually a sermon series that I've been compiling and, and trying to put together and trying to wait for the, the right particular time. And um, to be honest with you, it, uh, it is something I don't want to put off at least addressing uh, today, at least in part, but there will be, hopefully as the Lord gives, an entire series on this uh, particular subject, which is extremely uh, sensitive, and I believe that Christians every day uh, in various places struggle with assurance. And I'm going to take you to a passage of Scripture to begin in preparation for the Lord's Supper in uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> and you know the passage of Scripture, probably by mind in chapter 11, uh, as we use this typically in preparation for the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul is taking the last supper that the Lord Jesus uh, had with his disciples before the cross. And, and the Apostle Paul is going to reflect upon that time, but also is going to use the very words of the Lord Jesus to help us to understand the significance of partaking of sac, uh, sacred communion. Now, the Lord Jesus has only asked us to do uh, a couple of ordinances as a church. Now, there are various actions that he's asked us to do, he's required of us, but in terms of the ordinances that he has asked us to make sure that we partake of, you've got uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, Blessed Communion, but you also have the ordinance of baptism. And this week, in preparation for the Lord's Supper, we are going to be uh, looking at this and it does tie into the sermon series. We're not going to have a video clip this morning. It does tie into the series overall about the foundations for the investigation when you're searching out Christ and who He is and making a, uh, a, a, a belief and a faith and a trust and a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we will be discussing the second of those ordinances next week uh, in talking about baptism, and that will return us to our, our sermon series. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, remember as a background what's taking place. The church here at Corinth was in quite a bit of disarray. The Apostle Paul is having to right a lot of wrongs, if you will. They're plagued by false teaching and false understandings. And the church has gotten away from the very things <clears throat> that are supposed to be the foundations. And even when it came to the Lord's Supper, they were using this um, and, and twisting it. Uh, as you know, the fruit of the vine, uh, some were partaking of this wrongly and, and getting drunk. Some were using this as a time to pig out at the local potluck. And uh, there were several other things that were gotten all out of sorts. But uh, in this particular passage, we come to something that I've shared with you before in terms of being ready to partake of communion, and uh, we're going to talk about that and launch into the subject of having assurance when it comes to your salvation, having assurance when it comes to your salvation. If you've got your copy of God's Word, we invite you to stand to honor and reverence the reading of God's holy and inspired Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we will look in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many, uh, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that as we prepare our hearts for this time of reverence and respect and reflection, I pray that, Father, your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts and in our minds, Father, and prepare us for that. And, Father, 
let us not overlook this opportunity to have that fellowship with you that's so special and so sacred. And Father, I pray that you'll bless these words, bless the time of invitation, and when it comes time for the bread and the cup to be passed, I pray that, Father, again, in all things, that, that you'd be exalted, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me of any error and any mistake that I've made, Father. And again, it's all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's a right way and a wrong way to do things, I believe that we're supposed to be striving to do the right things, correct? If you will remember when you were, <clears throat> I'll use the South Mississippi terminology, a youngin, there was a time where your parents or your grandparents or your aunt and uncle or somebody influential in your life set you down and began to tell you when you went to eat or uh, sit down for a meal, there's a proper way to do things. Now, I will be dead honest with you, I never took a lot of the, the elegant um, uh, classes on uh, how to do things properly and all that kind of stuff. That's just not my thing. I don't know very much about it. But um, I remember uh, being taught early on, um, and even before I can, I can even remember, that it was always... Uh, modeled before me and always a mandate that we always pray and ask God to bless the food. We thank Him for the food. Now, you may say, well, you know, we just don't do that anymore. My question would be, then why? Well, if we're in a restaurant, you know, people are going to see us and, you know, it may offend somebody. I would say that the Lord Jesus talked about the whole thing of if you're ashamed of him then one day when you're standing before the father does anybody remember that over in Matthew it's recorded and we believe the lie and the miscalculation that if we're in a restaurant and we pray that it's going to have this offense to somebody well let me explain something to you folks I need you to understand this from a heart of love those people aren't worried about offending you. That's why you hear them take the name of the Lord in vain, just the table over from you. So why are we going to be ashamed of the God that is inside of us when the whole entire time people could care less if we're offended or not? And I'm going to take it a step further, and some of you are going to disagree but I want you to think about it. The Bible does talk about this. But you know, it's actually a good thing to be offended when it comes to the things of God because that leads to conviction. And I'm not saying that you go around with the Bible beating people over the head or that you go around with your finger in their face constantly. I'm not talking about that kind of thing, but I'm talking about a consistency in lifestyle where people know who you are and whose you are, it don't matter if you're at a restaurant. And by the way, don't let it send a mixed signal to the people you share your household with either. You get them to stop by with you and pray before the meal. Because what you're doing is teaching by your lack of concern or teaching by your silence that it really is not that important. And I'm going to tell you this, God loves a person that is grateful for what he's done. The Bible talks over and over and over about having thanksgiving in our hearts. It's not just a time of year. It is a lifestyle for the believer. And when you come to this passage of Scripture, as it's talking about, you can do this in an unworthy fashion. Church, I believe just as it was straight for the church at Corinth, Back in this time, in the Apostle Paul's time, I believe it works just as well for right now. Many among you are weak. Many are sick. Many are asleep. That talking about death. And you can say all day long, well, I believe God's merciful. He wouldn't take somebody out for uh, misusing the Lord's Supper. You can believe that all you want to, but I'm going to veer off what Scripture says and stick with that. And second off, just because it doesn't mean that you're physically dead, it may mean that you have led to a spiritual decay and a spiritual death because you're taking in vain the things of God which were told from the very beginning not 
to do. And churches take place every week where we tag on the Lord's Supper to the end of the service or we do it because it's the fifth Sunday or we do it because we're supposed to do that. And God forbid, I've even heard it said, that people are doing it because it's in the bylaws of the church. Well, let me explain to you. Bylaws in and of themselves aren't a bad thing, but if that is the reason that you're partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning, I don't want you to stand in front of God and have to answer for that. Don't do it. You do it because the Word of God commands it. And we do it to identify that we are a New Testament church. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And people for centuries, even going back to Paul's time, going back to John's time, they accused the early church Christians of being cannibalistic. Because when we partake of the fruit of the vine, that is the uh, symbolism of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And so they would persecute the early church and say that they must be cannibals because they're eating his flesh and they're drinking his blood. Those Christians sure have lost it. Well, I'll say, yes, we did lose it. I lost it, and I'm glad I did. But let me tell you what I lost. I lost the old man, and I became new. I lost the sin, and I became close to the Savior. I lost the transgressions, and I got truth. And I lost the uh, threat of hell and of death and the grave and hopelessness. And I've been translated into the kingdom of his dear light. I'm out of darkness into his marvelous light. I once was not called, but now I'm called. I had not been given mercy, now I've been given mercy. And now I'm called away from the things that are of this world to be a part of the glorious spread of the gospel of Christ. Yes, I've lost it. I've lost it. Some of y'all need to lose it. We're so apologetic. We're so... We've taken the, the idea of meekness because we know Jesus told us that meek, meekness is a great thing. It's going to be rewarded. But we've taken the concept of meekness and we've turned it to weakness. And I'll explain something to you that is so misrepresented by this world. They talk about Christ, and they talk about how that he was led. They take the scriptures a, a, twisted a little bit. And they say, you know, the whole thing about being led as a lamb to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth, all that. See, Jesus, they just let, he, he just let them all beat up on him, and it, it, took, it took him in, unto the death. And, and see, Christians, y'all aren't nothing but uh, doormats, because that's what y'all have to live like. Let me explain something to you. Meekness is that power under control. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free. Y'all are forgetting he chose not to. And then this world, we can make choices. We can condemn the world. We can stand in a judgment over the people in this world. But we'll be in sin, you know why? Why? Because our job is not to condemn. Our job is to point them to truth. And when the scripture here is talking about this self-examination that's going to take place, I'd ask you this. Isn't it easier to partake of the Lord's Supper and never stop to think about the wrong that's in your life? Matter of fact, you can just say this. We'll pass the cups out. You're going to have two of them. You, you put the first thing in, in your mouth. It, it really don't taste bad or good. It's just indifferent. And then you shoot the, the grape juice behind it. Everybody can do that and go home and watch football, right? If you want to be a part of that, go ahead. Because many that go to church on a weekly basis do. I've got to be honest with you. That's not what I'm after. Because I don't want to miss a thing when it comes to Christ. You can say, well, Josh, you've done this your whole life. I mean, you've seen this, you've done it your whole entire life. What's going to make this day any different? Well, let me ask you, what's going to make it different for you? 
Because I guarantee you, if you'll start with that examination, what will happen is you'll be on your knees before God and you'll be saying, cleanse me, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy. And I believe that if we're going to be real about it, the assurance that many people are looking for today would be given through that evaluation, that examination. But because it's so painful, many of us shy away from it. I'm a sinner. And that strikes against the ego and the pride. And today I would say this. The church needs to have its ego and its pride struck down. If you want that mighty move of God, it will be because we did do away with that. Here in Scripture, Paul is dealing with the strength in talking about being guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And this examination that's going to take place is so that we do things in a decent order and in a decent fashion and that we keep it focused on the thing with which it should be focused on and that being the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When we talk about assurance, one of the greatest problems that plagues Christians today, and I believe is the very most crippling device of Satan himself, is when a, a born-again believer begins to doubt their salvation and begins to question where they stand with the Lord on a basis of eternity. Most of us that, are, that would be honest would probably say at some point or another we've questioned this, we've dealt with it. I know that it's been painful at times for me. The book of 1 John is, is an epistle that is written to deal with just that. And if you are finding yourselves in doubt in regards to your salvation, I would encourage you to read the book of 1 John. It will talk to you about how to be assured. It will give you some things to look for in your own life. I want to show you a couple of those really briefly before we lead into our time of invitation and then our uh, time in communion. But for example, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In 1 John 3, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. 1 John 4, 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. 1 John 5, 10 talks about, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. And this is the record that God hath given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that, you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That word to know there, I literally spent hours this last week on that one word, know. And let me explain to you the significance of it the Greek language is quite a bit more specific than our English language. This particular word for to know is, it means to know for certain, to get it. Um, it's, it, it carries the idea of clarity and definite and decisive confidence. It's an assurance that Nothing can disturb or make uncertain. Nothing at all. And it can be tied to having a knowledge of 
from experiencing. I'm going to bring this time to a close. And as I'm doing so, I'm going to ask our prayer partners and our praise team to come on. But I want to share something that was written in 1873 or thereabout that talks about this very thing. And many of you are so familiar with this, but I want you to just listen to it and act like you've never heard it before. It was around this, this very theme that we're talking about that these famous words were penned in 1873. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending, Bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. If you're concerned about your salvation, your eternity with God, where you stand, I would encourage you to not take on that by yourself. I would encourage you as... Fanny Crosby recorded back in 1873 to find that blessed assurance. Struggling with that level of doubt can be very difficult. But today we don't have to. For our time of invitation, if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd love to share with you how to have that blessed assurance. And for those of you who are questioning or have been through a time of questioning and maybe you've just been nervous about it because you're worried about what everybody's going to think well to be honest with you 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 need to be concerned about what the Lord thinks most of all and this is not an embarrassing subject as you may feel that it is but it's one that the New Testament teaches us to do is to have our hearts assured before him And today, we can have that that assurance. So our prayer partners are coming down. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to have our time of invitation leading up to the Lord's Supper. Our Father, we are grateful for this day and the blessings of it. And I pray that, Father, that you would forgive us and cleanse us from any and all unrighteousness. And I pray for those who struggle with that assurance or those doubts. And I pray, Father, that bondage be broken today and that lives be changed, that people would be saved. And Father, as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you'll have our hearts right, cleanse us, Father, and that we may take in a worthy manner, Father. Even though we ourselves are unworthy, you've cleansed us and you made us whole, for which we thank you. Be with this time of invitation, in Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you would stand, our hymn of invitation is I Surrender All, our prayer partner.